So I'm going to get started. Can everyone see the slides fine? I'm going to take that as a yes. So please let me know if something's not working. Okay, so this week we're gonna be talking about psychological disorders. And this is going to be a very content heavy like day. So if you want me to repeat something or go over something a little more in detail, just let me know in the chat and I'll be sure to do that. Okay, so mental illness or mental health disorders cover a wide area of conditions. These disorders can affect mood, thinking, and behavior. As for what causes them, it's a combination of genetics, environmental stresses, and biochemical imbalances in the brain. The six different types of mental disorders that we will talk about are mood disorders, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, psychotic disorders, eating disorders, and finally substance abuse disorders. So let's start off with an activity. On the Google Classroom page, there should be a PDF assignment that just opened up. On it, there will be categories of mental illnesses and various different disorders with that on the sheet. And so without searching anything up, try to sort them into the right categories. It's okay if you don't get all of them right. I'll give you around five to 10 minutes to do it. And then if you don't finish it by then, that's fine. No worries. We'll go over it right after. So I'll give you until 7.15 to do that. Actually, how about we go until 7.12ish? So let me know if you can't find the like document or if you need any help finding it. Otherwise, go ahead and work on it. So the activity should be in the Google Classroom.
Okay, so now I'm going to move on and there's going to be an answer key on the next slide. So if you have any questions about these, I'll just give you a quick answer and then we'll probably talk about these as we go more in depth into these types of disorders. So I'll give you around three minutes to just look at this answer key and make any corrections as necessary. Okay, is everyone done with this? Okay, so for each category that I go over, I'm going to go over one specific disorder so for example, when I'm gonna talk about mood disorders, I'm gonna talk more into major depressive disorder and so on. So I'm not gonna be going over like all of the ones here, but I can give you resources about those if you'd like. So let's get started. First of all, what is a mood disorder? A mood disorder causes your general emotional state or mood to be distorted or inconsistent with your circumstances and it interferes with your ability to function. You may be extremely sad and irritable or depressed, or you may have periods of depression alternating with being excessively happy or mania. Not only can mood disorders cause disruption in the person's life or job, it can also increase a person's risk for heart disease, diabetes, and other diseases. So I'm just gonna give you more information on major depressive disorder. The last two diagnostic symptoms are highlighted just so like you can read it easier. There's no like nothing special about those. So first up, we have major depressive disorder. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. The mood can sometimes appear as irritability. It affects how you feel, think, and behave, and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. People who have it may have trouble doing normal day-to-day -day activities, and sometimes they may feel as if life isn't worth living. More than just a bout of the blues, depression isn't a weakness and you can't simply snap out of it. The main symptoms that help diagnose it are depressed mood, sleep disturbance, loss of interest, which is also known as anhedonia, guilt or feelings of worth worthlessness, energy loss and fatigue, concentration problems, appetite and weight change, psychomotor agitation, which is kind of like pacing the room or bouncing your leg, and finally, uh, suicidal ideations. A depressive episode is characterized by at least five out of nine of these symptoms. One of the five symptoms must either be depressed mood or loss of interest. Finally, these symptoms must be shown for at least two weeks for one to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Next, we're gonna be talking about substance abuse disorders. So drug addiction, which is also called substance use disorder, is a disease that affects a person's brain and behavior and leads to an inability to control the use of a legal or illegal drug or medication. Substances such as alcohol, marijuana, and nicotine are also considered drugs. The symptoms below are indicative of drug addiction. And if anyone wants to write down any of these symptoms, I'll just wait like a minute.
Okay. I'm so instead of talking about a specific like disorder that's in this category, we're going to be looking at the stages of overcoming addiction. So first there's pre-contemplation, which is when an addict has not yet acknowledged that there's a problem. Second, there's contemplation, which is when the addict has acknowledged that there's a problem, but they're not willing to make a change. Third, there's preparation, where the patient's getting ready to do something and change their behavior, but they're not quite there yet. Fourth, there's action, when the patient is in the process of changing their behaviors. Fifth, there's maintenance, when the patient, obviously, maintains their behavioral changes. And finally, and most importantly, optionally, there's relapse, which is when an addict or patient could return to old behaviors and abandon their changes. I'll just leave this here for a little bit so you can write down steps. And then we'll move on to anxiety disorders. Okay. Also, if I go a little too fast or skip a slide too fast, don't hesitate to like type in the chat that you want me to go back. I will go back. Okay, now what are anxiety disorders? First off, anxiety is your brain's way of reacting to stress and alerting you of potential danger ahead. Everyone feels anxious now and then. For example, you may worry when faced with a problem at work before taking a test or before making an important decision. Occasional anxiety is okay, but anxiety disorders are different. They're a group of mental Ill illnesses that cause constant and overwhelming anxiety and fear. The excessive anxiety can make you avoid work, school, family get-togethers, and other social situations that might trigger or worsen your symptoms. And anxiety disorders are more prominent in women than men. So for this category, I'm gonna talk a little bit more of gen about generalized anxiety disorder. So generalized anxiety disorder is characterized by persistent and excessive worry about a number of different things. People with this disorder may anticipate disaster and may be overly concerned about money, health, family, work, or other issues. Individuals with generalized anxiety disorder find it difficult to control their worry. They may worry more than seems warranted about actual events or may expect the worst even when there is no apparent reason for concern. Generalized anxiety disorder is diagnosed when a person finds it difficult to control worry on more days than not for at least six months and has three or more of the symptoms shown here. This differentiates generalized anxiety disorder from worry that may be specific to a set stressor or for a more limited period of time. And so, so um, the only like really seasonal like mental disorder I can think of is seasonal affective disorder, which is more similar to depression than it is to anxiety. And so these symptoms for this, are restlessness, irritability, sleep disturbances, fatigue, muscle tension, and difficulty concentrating. The most important thing to remember here is that there's no specific stressor that triggers generalized anxiety disorder. Now we're gonna move on to personality disorders. So let's think about what a personality trait is versus a personality disorder. A personality trait is a habitual pattern of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And you will consistently have this trait, but it might not affect all of your life. And it's possible that it will change. So an example of a trait is introversion. So perhaps around your family, you're not as introverted. And with age, you'll become even less so. However, a personality disorder is a way of seeing the world that deviates from the norm and means you have certain behaviors that negatively affect all of your life, all of the time since early adulthood. So let me give you an example of this. So someone who has narcissistic traits might be very cold and ruthless at work, but kind to his children and friends. Perhaps they only became so ruthless since a big promotion was on the line. However, someone who has narcissistic personality disorder would be unable to empathize with anyone in any area of life. And this would have been the way since late adolescence. So the main difference here between a personality disorder and a personality trait is that those with personality disorders think and feel entirely different than others, while well, well, people with basic personality traits can understand others. And so people with personality disorders are usually unaware that they have the disorder. So 
These personality disorders are separated into three different clusters or categories, cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. For each of these clusters, I'll basically um, give you a brief overview over the entire cluster and then give you an example of one disorder in that cluster. So first, let's start off with cluster A. And so the personality disorders in this cluster are paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal. And the example I'll go over a little later is paranoid personality disorder. So first off, in all of the cluster A personality disorders, the patients are usually odd or eccentric, and they show no psychosis. On top of that, they have an inability to develop meaningful relationships. So the example that we're going to go over here is paranoid personality disorder. So an ind individual with paranoid personality behavior is very suspicious of other people. They mistrust the motives of others and believe that others want to harm them. Additional hallmarks of this condition include being reluctant to confide in others, bearing grudges, and finding demeaning or threatening subtext in even the most innocent of comments or events. A person with paranoid personality disorder can be quick to feel anger and feel hostile towards others. Okay, next we have the cluster B personality disorder. Oh, and also those like words at the top that are after cluster A, aloof, accusatory, and awkward, have to go with the three um, personality disorders that are there. So aloof goes with paranoid, accusatory goes with schizoid, and awkward goes with schizotypal. And so it'll basically be the same for the rest, and I'll kind of go over that when I go to cluster B, which is right now. So bad goes with antisocial, which I'll talk about a little more. Borderline goes with borderline personality disorder. Flamboyant goes with histrionic personality disorder, and best goes with narcissistic. And yes, there will be a cahoot. So in all of the cluster B personality disorders, patients are usually dramatic, emotional, or erratic. And um, most of the people that have these cluster B personality disorders also get it through genetic association with mood disorders and substance abuse. So the example we're going to go over here is antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder, sometimes called sociopathy, is a mental disorder in which a person consistently shows no regard for right and wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. People with antisocial personality disorder tend to antagonize, manipulate, or treat others harshly or with callous indifference. They show no guilt or remorse for their behavior. Individuals with antisocial personality disorder often violate the law of becoming criminals. They may lie, behave violently or impulsively, and have problems with drug and alcohol use, like I mentioned earlier. Because of these characteristics, people with this disorder typically can't fulfill responsibilities related to family, work, or school. So when you think, when you hear antisocial personality disorder, think sociopath. And then finally, we move on to cluster C. Cowardly has to do with the avoidant personality disorder. Obsessive compulsive has to do with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, not to be confused with obsessive compulsive disorder. I'll tell you a little bit of the difference after I talk about this section. And finally, clingy goes with dependent disorder. In all of the cluster C personality disorders, patients are usually anxious and fearful, and their personality disorders are usually genetically, genetically associated with anxiety disorders. So the example for this one is going to be avoidant personality disorder. Avoidant personality disorder is characterized by feelings of extreme social inhibition, inadequacy, and sensitivity to negative criticism and rejection. Yet the symptoms involve more than simply being shy or socially awkward. Avoidant personality disorder causes significant problems that affect the ability to interact with others and maintain relationships in day-to-day -day life. When in social situations, a person with avoidant personality disorder may be afraid to speak up for fear of saying the wrong thing, blushing, stammering, or otherwise getting embarrassed. You may also spend a great time anxiously studying those around you for signs of approval or rejection. Dis despite the self-awareness that people have here, comments by others about your shyness or nervousness in social settings may feel like criticism or rejection. Now I'm gonna kind of explain why obsessive compulsive personality disorder is different from obsessive compulsive disorder. So people with OCD are aware that they have something wrong. They know that like the actions that they're doing are hurting them 
However, people with OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, tend to think that, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong, but everyone else is. So that's the difference between those Wait, two. Wait, what is OCPD? OCPD is basically the same thing as OCD, where, like, let's no, say... No, I'm asking what OCD is. Yeah, I'm... So OCPD is basically the same thing as OCD, except the only difference is that they're not aware that they're doing something wrong or something hurting them. No, I meant what's OCD, not OCPD. What is oh, OCD? sorry, I misheard you. So OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder, and it has to do with people having these obsessions, and that, like, causes them to do these actions that are hurtful. So someone could be obsessed with let's say, being clean. And what happens is they have to do these certain actions, otherwise they'll like feel anxious or they'll feel like something bad's gonna happen them, for, to them. For example, like, again, let's say someone's obsessed with cleanliness, they'll have to like, I don't know, clean their hands with bleach, which obviously is not very good. And, but they have to do that in order to get rid of like the anxiety that they feel. Does that make sense? I will take that as a yes. And then we're going to move on to psychotic disorders. Oh, actually, no, we're gonna move on to eating disorders. So eating just, oh, just trigger warning. If any of you are sensitive to this, please like, I, I don't know, mute me. And then like come back maybe in like two, not two, three minutes, like five-ish minutes. And then we'll be moving on to the next disorder. So eating disorders are serious conditions related to persistent eating behaviors that negatively impact your health, your emotions, and your ability to function in important areas of life. So the first one we're going to talk about is anorexia nervosa. Anorexia is an eating disorder characterized by an abnormally low body weight, an intense fear of gaining weight, and a distorted perception of weight. People with anorexia place a high value on controlling their weight and shape using extreme efforts that tend to significantly interfere with their lives. So to prevent weight gain or to continue losing weight, people with anorexia usually severely restrict the amount of food they eat. They may control caloric intake by vomiting after eating or by misusing laxatives. And they could also like try to lose that weight by excessively exercising. And no matter how much weight is lost, a person continues to fear gaining weight. People with anorexia have a BMI or body mass index of less than 18.5. So for reference, healthy people have a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9. And then the next eating disorder we're gonna talk about is bulimia nervosa. Bulimia nervosa is a serious, potentially life-threatening eating disorder characterized by a cycle of binging, which is eating a lot, and compensatory behaviors such as self-induced vomiting designed to undo or compensate for the effects of binge eating. Patients are usually in the normal BMI range. Next, we're gonna talk about um, psychotic disorders, but first off, we're gonna talk about psychosis. So this is not a disorder, but is instead a symptom. Psychosis is characterized by an impaired relationship with reality. It's a symptom of serious mental disorders. People who are experienced psychosis might either, ha either have hallucinations or delusions. So next, we're gonna talk about delusions, disorganized thoughts, and hallucinations. So delusions are defined as fixed false beliefs that conflict with reality. Despite contrary evidence, a person in a delusional state can't let go of their convictions. Delusions are often reinforced by the misinterpretations of events. And so many delusions also involve some level of paranoia. Disorganized thinking is a failure to be able to think straight. Thoughts may come and go rapidly. The person may not be able to concentrate on one thought for very long and may be easily distracted, unable to focus attention. They may not be able to string sentences together and instead mix up their words. Finally, hallucinations are sensations that appear to be real but are created within the mind. For example, it's like seeing things that are not there, hearing voices or other sounds, or experiencing body sensations like crawling feelings on the skin or smelling odors that aren't there. 
So next we're gonna talk about disassociative identity disorder. And this is a psychotic disorder. So this was formerly known as multiple personality disorder. And DID is a mental disorder characterized by the maintenance of at least two distinct and relatively enduring personality states. The disorder is accompanied by memory gaps beyond what would be explained by ordinary forgetfulness. The personality states are alternately show in a person's behavior. However, presentations of the disorder may vary. And this is more common in women than men. So what I mean by this is someone probably has multiple personalities, and this is usually caused by childhood trauma. So a good way to think about this is think of a glass bowl. That glass bowl is one personality. Now, imagine that that glass bowl goes like under some trauma, like it's dropped and it shatters. Which one's the original piece? No one piece is more important than another, but they're all still there. They're all part of the bowl. So in this case, the host is the personality slash individual that has been present since before the onset of the disorder. And each of the personalities are known as alters. These alters usually take roles such as the protector or the caretaker. So does anyone have any questions about any of these disorders? Or want to know a little bit more about any of these disorders? Okay, so I'm going to play this one video and then right after we will go on to our Kahoot. Uh, let me, okay. Can you all see the video fine? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Way back in 1887, a journalist named Elizabeth Cochran assumed the alias Nellie Bly and feigned a mental illness to report on the truly awful conditions inside psychiatric hospitals in the U.S., which were known as asylums at the time. She found rotten food, cold showers, prevalent rats, abusive nurses, and patients being tied down in her famous expose, 10 days in a madhouse. What she documented had been pretty standard mental health treatment for centuries, but her work led the charge in mental health reform. It's been a long battle. Nearly a century later, in 1975, American psychologist David Rosenhan published a paper called On Being Sane in Insane Places, detailing the experiment that he conducted on psychiatric institutions themselves. The first part of his experiment involved sending pseudo-patients, a group of eight totally mentally sound associates, including David himself, to knock on institution doors and falsely report that they'd been hearing voices. Once admitted, the fake patients abandoned their fake symptoms and behaved as they normally did, waiting for administrators to recognize them as mentally healthy. Like Cochran, Rosenhan and his team learned that it's easy to get into a mental institution, but it is much, much harder to get out. The participants were kept in the institution for an average of 19 days, one of them for 52 days. They were forced to take psychotropic medication, which they sneakily spit out, and were eventually discharged with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia in remission. Of course, being dubbed in remission isn't exactly the same thing as being labeled sane, and that was just one of Rosenhan's criticisms of the system. It viewed mental illness as an irreversible condition, almost like a personality trait rather than a curable illness. Part two of his experiment came later, when Rosenhan shared his results with a teaching hospital and then told the staff that he'd be sending more pseudo-patients their way in the next few months, and challenged them to detect the imposters. With that in mind, out of 193 new patients, 41 were ferreted out as likely or suspected pseudopatients. The thing is, Rosenhan never actually sent in any pseudopatients. In the end, Rosenhan concluded that the way people were being diagnosed with psychiatric issues often revealed less about the patients themselves and more about their situation. Like, saying you've heard voices one time might catch a doctor's attention a lot more than weeks of normal behavior. Naturally, people criticized his methods and his findings, but his experiment raised a lot of important questions, like how do we define, diagnose, and classify mental disorders? At what point does SAD become 
depressed, or quirky, become obsessive compulsive, or energetic, become hyperactive. What are the risks and benefits of diagnostic labeling, and how does the field keep evolving? When people think of psychology, they probably most often think about the conditions that it's been designed to understand, diagnose, and treat. Namely, psychological disorders, from common problems that most of us will experience at some point in our lives, to the more serious dysfunctions that require intensive care. They're a big part of what psychology is here for, and over the next several lessons, we're going to be looking at mental illness, as well as wellness, how symptoms are diagnosed, and what biological and environmental causes may be at work. But to grasp those ideas, we first have to find out how we came to understand the idea of mental health itself, and build a science around studying, discussing, and caring for it. In 2010, the World Health Organization reported that about 450 million people worldwide suffer from some kind of mental or behavioral disorder. No society is immune from them. But when I say psychological disorder, I'm guessing some of you will conjure up all sorts of dramatic images like diabolical criminals from Arkham Asylum or Hollywood stereotypes of various eccentric, scary, or tragic figures. This roll call of one-sided stock images is part of the problem our culture faces, the misconceptions and often destructive stigma associated with psychological disorders. So, what does that term actually mean? Mental health clinicians think of psychological disorders as deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional patterns of thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. And yeah, there are a lot of sensitive and loaded words in there, so let's talk about what we mean. Starting with deviant. Sounds like I'm talking about doing things that are dicey or raunchy, but in this context it's used to describe thoughts and behavior that are different from most of the rest of your cultural context. Of course, being different is usually wonderful. Geniuses and Olympians and visionaries are all deviants from the norm, so it probably goes without saying that the standards for so-called deviant behavior change a lot across cultures and in different situations. For example, in a combat situation, killing people is probably to be expected, but murder is definitely deviant criminal behavior back home in times of peace. And in some contexts, speaking to spirits or ancestors is A-OK, -okay, but in other settings, say a bar in Iowa City at happy hour, it might not be quite acceptable. But to be classified as a disorder, that deviant behavior needs to cause the person or others around them distress, which just means a subjective feeling that something is really wrong. In turn, distress can lead to truly harmful dysfunction when a person's ability to work and live is clearly often measurably impaired. So that's today's definition, but it took a long time for the Western world to come up with a way of thinking about psychological disorders that was rooted in science and investigative inquiry. It wasn't until around the 18th and 19th century that we really started to put forth the notion that mental health issues might be about a sickness in the mind. For example, by the 1800s, doctors finally caught on to the fact that advanced syphilis could manifest in serious neurological problems, like dementia and irritability and various mental disorders. So eventually, a lot of so-called mental patients were removed from asylums to full medical hospitals where all of their symptoms could be treated. This aha moment is just one instance of how perspectives on mental health began to shift toward what's called the medical model of psychological disorder. The medical model champions the notion that psychological disorders have physiological causes that can be diagnosed on the basis of symptoms and treated and sometimes even cured. That way of thinking about mental health was an important step forward, at least at first. It took us past the old days of simply locking people up when they didn't seem quite right to others. But even if it was an improvement, the medical model is seen by some in the field as kind of narrow and outdated. Most contemporary psychologists prefer to view mental health more comprehensively through what called the biopsychological approach. You've heard us say over and over again that everything psychological is simultaneously biological, and that truism is particularly useful here. The biopsychological view takes that holistic perspective, accounting for a whole number of things, both clearly physiological and not, in order to understand what's happening to us, what might be going wrong, and how it can be treated. It takes into account psychological influences for sure, like stress and trauma and memories, but also biological factors like genetics and brain chemistry and social, cultural, influences, like all the expectations wrapped up in how a culture defines normal behavior. So by considering the whole host of nature and nurture influences, we can take a broader view of mental health, realizing that some disorders can be cured, while others can be coped with, and still others may end up not being disorders at all once our culture accepts them. But another important part of handling disorders with scientific rigor is attempting to standardize and measure them, how we talk about them, how we diagnose them, and how we treat them. So the field has literally come up with a manual that shows you how to do that, but it is not without its flaws. It's called the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-5, because it's currently in its fifth edition. And it is used by practically 
everybody. Clinicians, obviously, but also by insurance and drug companies and policymakers and the whole legal system. The first edition came out in 1952, and this newest version was released in 2013. What's particularly interesting about it is that it's designed to be a work in progress. Forever. Each new edition incorporates changes based on the latest research, but also how our understanding of mental health and behavior evolves over time. For example, believe it or not, the first two editions actually classified homosexuality as a pathology, basically a disease. The 1973 third edition eliminated that designation, reflecting changing attitudes and a developing understanding of sexual orientation. And just by looking at the changes between the edition used today and the previous version released in the year 2000, you can get a picture not only of how quickly things change, but also how classification can affect diagnosis, for better or worse, and also what the risks are of classifying psychological disorders in the first place. For instance, the new edition reflects our growing understanding of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and it changed the name of childhood bipolar disorder to disruptive mood dysregulation disorder because kids were being overdiagnosed and overtreated for bipolar disorder when the condition that they had didn't actually fit that description. And totally new diagnoses are being explored as well, like gambling addiction and what's called internet gaming disorder, showing that new disorders continue to arise with changing times. But the DSM is not perfect. Even though we've come a long way since the Rosenhan experiment, critics still worry about how the DSM might inadvertently promote the over- or misdiagnosis and treatment of certain behaviors. Others echo Rosenhan's concerns that by slapping patients with labels, we're making them vulnerable to judgments and preconceptions that'll affect how others perceive and treat them. In the end, it's just important to keep in mind that definitions are powerful, and things can get tricky pretty fast in the world of mental health. Today, you learned about how we define psychological. Okay, so now it's perfect time. Here we Okay, I think we'll just get started again.
nice. Angie, let's go. Remember, I'm only going to ask you questions on things I talked about today. So if you didn't really recognize any of the other ones, then that's not it. Yep, so all of these are right. So it was mentioned very briefly, but yes, women do experience anxiety disorders more than men. So this is false. So for general anxiety disorder, they have to show at least three symptoms for six months to be diagnosed. It's a tricky one. Nice. So yes, avoidant and antisocial are the two personality disorders here. Oh no, oh my goodness. So all those go over cluster C again. Cluster C includes avoidant, obsessive compulsive, and dependent personality disorders. And in all of the disorders, patients are usually anxious and fearful, and the personality disorders are usually genetically associated with anxiety disorders. You guys picked personality uh, cluster A, and in cluster A, like the patients are kind of odd, kind of weird. I kind of gave it away. So yeah, it is close to A that is odd or it's eccentric. Nice. Okay, so yes, you all chose the two right answers, but the more like, I guess, currently correct answer would be disassociative identity disorder. It was previously called multiple personality disorder, but they found that disassociative identity like described it better. But you did all get it right. Yes. Oh, so yeah, I guess most of you did. Well, equal amounts, so you got it right and got it wrong. So a host is basically what it says. 
like they existed before they had the multiple personalities. Hmm. What does purging mean? Basically like throwing it up, getting rid of the food. Yes. So all of these are different eating disorders, but this one is bulimia nervosa. Oh, equal. So, so when a person, I guess, switches between their alters or personalities, there has to be some sort of amnesia block for at least one of the personalities for it to be considered disassociative identity disorder. Last question. This is kind of a wild card. Nice. Yay, good job guys. So I guess we are ending.